Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Travels Part 3 A Voyage to Laputa Balnebarby Glubdubdrib Lugnag in Japan Chapter 1 The author sets out on his third voyage is taken by pirates the malice of a Dutchman his arrivals at an island he is received in Tilaputa. I had not been at home above ten days when Captain William Robinson, a Cornish man, commander of the Hopewell, a stout ship of three hundred tons, came to my house. I had formerly been a surgeon of another ship where he was master, and a fourth part owner. In a voyage to the Levant, he had always treated me more like a brother than an inferior officer, and hearing of my arrival made me a visit, and as, he, as I apprehended only out of friendship, for nothing passed more than what is usually after long absences, but his visits repeating often, expressing his joy to find me in good health, asking whether I was now settled for life adding that he intended a voyage to the East Indies in two months. At last, he plainly invited me, though with some apologies, to be the surgeon of the ship, that I should have another surgeon under beside me, our two mates, that my Salisbury should double to be my usual pay. And after experiencing my knowledge in sea affairs to be equal to his, he would enter to any engagement to follow my advice, as much if I had a share of command. He said so many other obliging things, and that I knew him to be the honest of man, that I could not reject his proposal, my thirst of seeing the world, notwithstanding my past fortunes continuing as violent as ever. The only difficulty remained was to persuade my wife, who consent, however, I at last obtained by the prospects of her she proposed to her children. We set out on the 5th day of August, 1706, and arrived at Fort St. George on the 11th of April, 17. Seven. Stayed there for free three weeks to refresh our crew, many of whom were sick. From thence we went to the Tomquin, where the captain resolved to continue some time, but he expected to be dispatched in some months. Therefore, in hopes to defray some of the charges he must be at, he brought a sloop loaded it with several goods, wherewith the Tonkonis usually trade into the neighboring islands, putting fourteen men on board, whereof three were of the country. He appointed me as master of the sloop, gave me power to traffic for two months, while he transacted his affairs at Tonquin. We had not sailed above three days when a great storm arising when we were driven five days to the north-northeast, and then to the east, after which we had fair weather, but still was a pretty strong gale from the west. Upon the tenth day we were chased by pirates, who soon overtook us, for my sloop was so deep loaden that she sailed very slow, and neither were we in a condition to defend ourselves. We were boarded about the same time by both the pirates, who entered it furiously at the head of their men, but finding us all prostrate upon our faces, so I gave order, they pinioned us with strong ropes, and setting a guard upon us, and went to search the sloop. I observed among them a Dutchman, who seemed to be some sort of authority, though he was not commander of either ship. He knew us by our accountants to be Englishmen, and jabbering to us in his own language, swore we should be tied back to back, 
and throw into the sea. I spoke Dutch tolerably well. I told him who we were, and begged him in consideration of our Christians and Protestants, in neighboring countries, in strict alliance, that he would move the captains to take some pity on us. This inflamed his rage, repeated his threatenings, and turning to his companions, spoke with great vehemence in the Japanese language, as I suppose often using the Christianos. The largest of the two pirate ships was commanded by a Japanese captain, who spoke little Dutch, but very imperfectly. He came up to me, and after several questions, which I answered in great humility, he said we should not die. I made the captain a very low bow, and then turning to the Dutchman, and said I was very sorry to find more mercy in a hathen than in a brother Christian. But I had soon reason to repent those foolish words, for that malicious reprobate, having it often endeavored in vain to persuade both the captains that I might be thrown into the sea, which they would not yield to, to after the promise made me that I should not die, however, prevailed so far as to have a punishment inflicted on me, worse than all human appearance than death itself. My men were sent by an equal division into both pirate ships, and my sloop new maimed. As to myself, it was determined that I should be set adrift in a small canoe with paddles and a sail. Four days' provisions, which the last Japanese captain was so kind to double out of his stores, and would permit no man to search me. I got down into the canoe, while the Dutchman standing the deck loaded me with all curses and injurious terms his language could afford. About an hour after we saw the pirates, I had taken an observation and found that we were at a latitude of 46 north and a longitude of 183. When I was at some distance from the pirates, I set up my sail, the wind being fair, with a design to reach the nearest of those islands, which I had made a shift to do in about three hours. It was all rocky, however, I got many bird eggs, and striking fire I kindled some heath and dry seaweed, which I roasted my eggs. I eat no other supper, but I resolved to spare my provisions as much as I could. I passed the night under shelter of a rock, throwing some heath under me. I slept pretty well. The next day I sailed to another island and thence to a third and fourth, sometimes using my sail, sometimes my paddles. But to not trouble the reader with a particular account of my distress, let it suffice that on the fifth day I arrived at the last island in my sight, which lay south-south-east to the former. This island was at a greater distance than I expected and I had not reached it in less than five hours. I encompassed it almost around before I could find a convenient place to land in, which was a small creek, about three times the wideness of my canoe. I found the island to be all rocky and intermingled with tufts of grass and sweet-smelling herb. I took up much small provisions, and after having refreshed myself, secured the remainder of the cave, whereof were great numbers. I gathered plenty of eggs upon the rocks, and with a quantity of dry seaweed and parched grass, which I could design to kindle the next day, and roast my eggs as well as I could, for I had about my flint, steel, and match in burning glass. I had lay all night in the cave when my, I had lodged my provisions. My bed was the same dry grass and seaweed which I intended for fuel. I slept very little, for the disquiet of my mind prevailed 
over my weariness and kept me awake. I considered how impossible it was to preserve my life in so desolate a place. How miserable my end must be. And I found myself so listless and desponding that I had not the heart to rise before I could get the spirits enough to creep out of my cave. The day was far advanced as I walked a while among the rocks. The sky was perfectly clear, and all of a sudden it became obscure, as I thought, in a manner very different from what happened by interposition of a cloud. I turned back and perceived a vast opaque between me and the sun. It seemed to be about two miles high and hid the sun six or seven minutes, but I did not observe the air to be much colder, or the sky darkened, and if I had stood under the shade of the mountain as it approached nearer over the place, it was appeared to be a firm substance, bottom flat, smooth, shining, very bright from the reflection of the sea. I stood upon a height about two hundred yards from the shore, and saw this vast body descending almost parallel to me, less than an English mile distance. I took out my pocket perspective, and could plainly discover numbers of people moving up and down the sides of it, which I thought to be sopping, but what those people were doing I was not able to distinguish. The natural love of life gave me inward motions of joy, and was to entertain a hope that this adventure might some way or other help to deliver me from the desolate place and condition that I was in. But at the same time, the reader can hardly conceive my astonishment to behold an island in the air, inhabited by men who were able, as to seem, to raise or sink or put it into a progressive motion, as they pleased. But not being at the time in a disposition of philosophers upon this phenomenon, I ch rather chose to observe what course the island would take, because it seemed for a little while to stand still, yet soon, after it was advanced nearer, and I can see the sides of it, encompassed with several gradations of galleries and stairs at certain intervals to descend from one another. The lowest gallery I beheld some people fishing with long angly rods, looking on. I waved my cap, for my hat was long worn out, my handkerchief towards the island, and near its approach. I called and shouted with the utmost strength of my voice, and looking circumspectly, I beheld a crowd to gather at the side which was most in my view, and found pointing them towards me to reach the other, and plainly discovered me, although they had no return to my shouting. I could see four or five men running in the great hast up the stairs into the top of the island, who then disappeared. I happened to rightly conjecture that these were sent for orders of some person of authority upon this occasion. The number of people increased in less than half an hour, the island was moved and raised in such a manner that the lowest gallery appeared in the parallel of less than a hundred yards distance from the height of where I stood. I then put myself into the most supplicating postures, and spoke in the humblest accent, but received no answer. Those who stood nearest over against me seemed to be persons of distinction, as I supposed by their habit they conferred earnestly with each other, looking upon me. At length, of one of them called out in a clear, polite, smooth dialect, unlike in the sound of Italian. Therefore, I returned an answer in that language, hoping at least that the condense might be more agreeable to his ears. Although neither of us understood each other, yet my meaning was easily known, for the people saw the distress I was in. They made signs for me to come down from the rock and go towards the shore, which I accordingly did, and the flying island being raised to a convenient height, the verge over me. A chain was let down from the lowest gallery, and the seat fastened the bottom, 
to which I fixed myself, and was drawn up by pulleys.